They stolen my lapel mic off me, the batteries are gone, so I have to use this mic today. Bit of inspirational song to get you started. Who's ever seen Gypsy the Musical? Hands up if you've seen Gypsy the Musical. Always very few. I saw that production I was playing, I saw him Elder Staunton in the West End in London. I had a cr cracking song. If you've actually seen the musical though, you'll actually... You might think it's not the most appropriate song to get you inspired into Eurovision, uh, but hopefully it'll you'll be cheated up with enthusiasm uh, by it. So in today's lecture, I want to start off with a little bit of inspiration. And then I'll talk about feedback a little bit and what feedback I want from you and what feedback you'll be getting from myself and the rest of the teaching team. And then move on to the core of the lecture, the sort of exam hints and tips and pulling uh, on the coursework and to really guide you in where you should be thinking and leading your revision when moving on towards the exam and some tips on revision. So, the inspiration. I'm currently doing a leadership course uh, in the university. It's very interesting. So, yeah, you never stop being learners, people. Even I am still learning. And it's got me thinking about, so actually a lot of my leadership is in teaching. It's in sort of inspiring you to be good students and sort of try and lead you to do really well in your assessments. And in one of the sessions, I was reflecting on the thing I do when I'm not lecturing here and doing my research and things, which is this. Hang on. Any swimmers in the room? Yeah. My stroke's really, really bad. My tumble toes don't look that bad. Since this video was made, I've learned how to bend my elbow. There we go. Why am I showing you this video of me swimming? Well, it's because when I swim, I like to pretend I'm not very, very competitive. And, but I do, I get in a bad mood when I don't come first. <laughs> and I say to people I swim with, I'm not competitive, I just don't like to come second. So why, why am I telling you this? This is because, I think, as I flagged at the start of the semester, the, because of the, it's one of these first two year modules and a lot of, people, lot of you are doing it, it's a core module and you're really committed to it and you're really enjoying it, but a lot of you aren't and a lot of you are just doing it because it was another module to choose. And so therefore, across the piece, like all of our modules, we do like this. Uh, attainment is quite low on them. It's like the average mark is sort of 53, 54, whereas we'd expect to see an average mark of 63, 64. But that's just because of the first two years of um, modules at University of Stirling is across the piece that's like, like that. But what I want you to do, I want you to have that in your mind that I'm not competitive, I just don't like to come second. I want to be the person who sits at the exam board this year and you've all done spectacularly well and, I've do, and this module has done better than all the modules so please be inspired by me. Don't come second, come first. Work hard and really, really do well in your exams. So that's my inspiration. Now to move on, just to talk about feedback then, um, we give it to you in a variety of ways. So um, the postgraduate tutors are working feverishly at the moment to mark your essays and hopefully all being well, we should have them done by tomorrow evening. So hopefully about 5.30 I should be able to release the marks to you. They are working really hard and they might not meet that deadline. So if they don't, it'll be very early next week though. So please bear with us. We're, we're getting there. It's a lot of essays to mark in a 297, and we're getting through them. So that's the key way you're getting feedback. But also you'll be getting feedback from your tutors in tutorials, in the, in the workshops where they'll be um, talking to you. And those of you who have come to see me in my office, office hours, you'll be getting feedback from me there. 
but also we need feedback from you. I know some of your tutors have been picking up the Enesis, the uh, module evaluation forms, uh, and handing them out in your workshops. So please fill them in when you get given them, and also use it as an opportunity to give me feedback on your tutors as well. They really don't get very much feedback, and they really value it, because we can only improve our teaching if we get good feedback from you, so we do value it. And also, if there's any further feedback, do feel free to email me. You can either just email me straight and give me the feedback in the email, or you can email me and we can arrange a meeting where you can come and see me. On the module-specific feedback, in previous years, I've done a uh, separate uh, Google form, like the one I got you to fill, in, uh, fill out at the start of the semester, to get specific feedback. I'm not going to do that this year. I'm going to use that anonymous function, the anonymous comment function on the website that you all use brilliantly well for the stupid questions. Those stupid questions were such good stupid questions. They were fantastic. I loved using that uh, tool in that way. I'm actually... Um, you're probably aghast at this. Um, the, the, the website is so innovative, we're going to be entering into competition next year. And it is around that kind of anonymous fo comment function. is very, very innovative. So I'm going to put a post up asking you for your anonymous comments. Oh, well, I will be able to see who, who you are, so don't be too mean. Um, and ask for your, any uh, specific feedback on the uh, website as well. Right, moving on now to talk about the revision. When we are considering your teaching and learning at university, we use this model to, cons to understand how you learn, big solo taxonomy. Those of you who are doing education, you might have come across this already. And what Biggs in his taxonomy do does is outline how the the different, so basically how deep learning gets. So you start off here with very, it's kind of when you, when you get a really bad mark, sort of the pre-structural, you completely miss the point of the learning outcome you're supposed to attain. And then in the middle we have quite shallow learning. So what does unistructural learning? So that's just very simple procedures that you just learn, you can do, um, uh, just you learn the procedure and just repeat it. Um, again and again and again. And then what, at university level, what we are moving you towards is these deeper types of learning, the relational, and particularly a module like this, the extend, extended abstract learning. I'm introducing this model to you because the way the exam is framed fits into this model. So the exam is two sections. So it's section A, and I'll be talking about this in depth soon, but they are questions of fact and interpretation. And section B, it's greater depth, it's applying wider theoretical learning to particular questions. And how that maps onto big, um, and then in the learning, what we're trying to get you to do is move up big solo taxonomy from pre-structural learning to the extended abstract learning. And how this then relates through to the exam is section A is multi-structural, so that's enumerate, describe, list, combine, or relational, compare, contrast, explain, analyze, relate, apply. So it's that sort of thing. That's the sort of learning that you can do from just having attended the lectures and reading the blog post. But the section B really good answers on section B, we have to see what we are looking for, what the learning outcomes are all about, is the extended abstract learning. So there we are looking for you to theorise, to generalise, to hypothesise as well. So if you look at something and you, you're not sure about it, you're using theory to think about it, and then hypothesise using that theory about uh, the answer. So it's that extended abstract learning that we're looking for. And in particular, what those section B questions do, and I'll draw on this later in the lecture, is because they're based on your coursework essays, they're asking you to take the theoretical insights you've gained from your coursework essays and apply them. And hopefully what you need to be doing in your 
you, you will do in your revision, or what you need to be doing in your revision, is deepening your understanding of those concepts. And that means you'll get that extended abstract depth. Uh, last year, what happened, I had a quick, quick and dirty analysis of the marks. Some students did worse on the exam than they did, did on the coursework. Some students, an equal number did better, and most people did the same. So what I want this year, though, is for you all to be much better. In the, in the exam to use that feedback from the coursework to deepen your understanding. So, top tips, basic top tips, read the instructions. You'll be amazed how many students make very basic errors by not reading the instructions. And also read the questions. Read the questions carefully. And make sure you then go on to answer, well, question the answer, but also answer the question. Really do it. Ooh. I cannot emphasize this enough. Answer the question. Answer the question that's there on the paper in front of you. Don't answer the question you think I want the answer to. I've set the question because that's the question you need to answer in front of you. So that's why it's important to read the question and answer it. But just to go back to my little bit of graffiti, if I can quickly. I can. Also, as I say, in the extended abstract learning, it's also about doing this questioning the answers as well. Ooh, my... So, as I say, it's a, so it's a two-hour exam. Answer all the questions for section A in one booklet. And answer one question from section B in another booklet. And you'll have a choice of four questions for section B. Now, section A. There are mock questions on succeed. I set these up last year, and they're still there, available for you to work through. And also, if you look at last year's paper, this should be the last year's first paper and the recent paper should be, be available on succeed for you to look at and to get an idea of what those section A questions look like. And that means by looking at them, practicing them, you won't be panicked in the exam when you look at them. On the main exam for last year as well, I also provided feedback to the students, which basically gives them the answers that also is available on Succeed. In your revision then, what should you focus on in your revision for Section A? Well, you need to be going back over your notes for the lectures and picking out the broad picture kind of stuff from the, the, the lectures, not the minute detail. What were the broad messages? What were the things I kept banging on about, kept coming back to in the lectures? And they're, they're, that's something that will help you. They'll be those basic questions of fact. Listen to the podcasts as well, and as you go through, just jot down well, what the key things I'm learning from this discussion I'm listening to. And have a quick have a look over the blog posts as well. And on the website early next week or tomorrow, I'll be putting up a blog post that will explain how you can easily access those different posts because they're all thematically categorised. You don't have to go through the entire thing. You can just search very quickly for them. Also, go back and think about the workshops as well. Think about, the, especially the, the applied ones, the ones where there wasn't much prep in advance. You actually just have to do things in the classroom. And I'll give the example here, workshop five, which was all the graphs about the ageing society. That's the kind of applied learning that I want to see you do in section A as well. So you're given a graph, a source material, and you have to respond to it. So what, what does this say about social policy? What can we interpret from this graph? and think about it in social policy terms. So think about how well you did in that workshop five. What did you find difficult? What did you find easy? What skills might help uh, you, do, what, what, the, what skills might help you to develop um, to do well at section A? I think broadly actually on last year, the uh, uh, student entertainment on section A was very good. So don't worry about it. Don't worry that I'm not telling you what the questions, the theme of the questions are going to be. They are just these interpretive questions or basic questions of fact, and people generally do quite well on them. Now, section B. So it's these big questions that are aligned with the coursework essay questions. So three of the questions are going to be aligned to your coursework essay questions. But also the fourth one I bung in is one for international students or, or anybody else who wants to go left field. And it's a comparative social policy question as well. So if you want to go 
completely off the wall with your revision and go and say, I don't know, find out everything you can about the Italian welfare state uh, and, and combine that with what you know about the UK welfare state, then that question will be the one for you. So that's another approach to take if you fancy that. Answer the question in front of you. So don't just regurgitate your coursework essay question. Look, read the question and think, okay, what do I know from doing my coursework essay? What knowledge have I gained? What theoretical approaches have I got that I can apply in answering this question? And demonstrate your wider reading and analysis in answering that question. We don't necessarily expect to see references in those answers to section B. You won't get marked down for not including references. But if you do include references, it's like bonus points. But it's not going to make the difference between a grade boundary, including references or not. So don't get hung up about that. But include them if you find it easy to. Don't worry if you can't. So what are the big concepts then? So first off, I thought I'd just go through the three essay questions, and hopefully there won't be too many shocked faces in the audience as I go through them, and highlight what are, what the, what, how else might we con conceptualise the big concept in the essay question. So this is the first one that you had. Is social policy in the UK or another country of your choice designed around the needs of white men in work? Just before I talk about this in any greater depth, I want to sort of talk a bit more passionately about this question because of a specific incident that has happened. Yesterday, a man, Stephen Port, was convicted of the murder of a number of young gay men in London. And if you follow me on Twitter, you'll have seen me tweeting about this this afternoon. I'd really recommend if you go onto the BBC News website, there's a very lengthy article about the police failings in this case, of how on at least four occasions they had an opportunity to arrest Stephen Port for murder. And they didn't, because basically they were institutionally homophobic. They believed that it was okay for young gay men to die in very unexplained, very odd circumstances with sex drugs in their bloodstream. They thought that was normal, that, that they didn't need to investigate that. And today, and it got me really bloody, really angry, somebody from the National, uh, it's a, it's a national Policing Organisation in England suggested that dating sites like Grindr should do more to protect the people that use them. And basically blamed the victims of these crimes for using these apps to hook up with people when they otherwise they don't have any other choice. So if you're gay, your dating pool is around 5% of the population. You can't just walk down the street and hope you'll meet your boyfriend. You have to use these dating apps. And this person blamed gay men for going out, using these apps, and getting murdered. And that's what we're talking about here. How can the lazy ways but the, the policy is implemented, by the way things are done, lead to structural discrimination against a particular group. That case of Stephen Paul makes me particularly angry because I am a gay man myself. But that applies across the board, across a wide range of policy areas. So right, back to the question then. So what might you need to, what, what are the big theoretical issues here? Well, on social policy then, we need to consider, is social policy a safety net? Is it just something that's there to stop people really experiencing the most of the worst poverty, or should it have greater ambitions? Should it be aiming to equalise people's social positions, to overcome some of the socio-economic disadvantages people face in their lives, or other structural disadvantages that people face in their lives? What, is, what should social policy aim to be doing? 
in either of those cases, no matter which of those two uh, approaches we take, we then have to think about need. So if it's a safety net, who needs that safety net? How might we conceptualise that need that individuals have for social policy interventions? How has social policy in the past done that? How do things like the best eligibility principle consider what people's need for social policy interventions are? Looking at then at the implementation of, of social policy, are the needs of ethnic minorities or other groups catered for within the way social policy is delivered and the way social policy is de designed? Or are they actually institutionally excluded or discriminated against because of the way social policy is designed? Classic case of that at the moment would be the benefits cap. Some of you picked up the, on this in your essay answers. Ethnic minorities, some ethnic minorities tend to have larger families, so they are have a disproportionately negatively impacted by the benefits cap. That concept of work. Well, what about people who can't work? What about disabled people? In the podcast with Diane Thinkston, we talked about this a lot. How can the social policy help or hinder disabled people? How can, what's the, what are the issues with the labour market that prevent disabled people being in work? On that concept of design, then are we con considering the design of all social policy or just certain policies? Where are you going to put the boundaries there in answering that question? Are you just going to talk about the welfare system? Are you just going to be talking about education as a form of social policy? But also that concept of design, as soon as you use the word design, then that opens up possibilities. Well, it doesn't have to be how it is now. We could have something designed very differently. So what could that different world be? What do people like John Hills suggest how we might design a welfare system differently? And on the gendered aspects, finally, do women have specific needs that are ignored by social policy? Could women get a lot more from social policy if it was designed differently? And in the last set of podcasts with Kirsty Rummery, we explored those issues. So these are kind of some of the sort of the deeper concepts that you need to have got out of your essay. And when you look back and you get your mark back for your essay, when you look at your coursework, but when you look at the feedback for your essay, consider how, how have you what do you know about these deeper concepts? What more could I learn about these deeper concepts? And where might I get that knowledge? Look at the resource list for that. Right. <coughs> Second question then, were the social policy achievements of the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government between 1999 and 2012 limited by political ambition or the devolution settlement? So there you need to know, first of all, what social policy competencies does the Scottish Government have? And then, picking up on the time, so I, in the essay question, 1999 to 2012, that's because the, so, that devolution settlement has changed over time. So how has it changed over time? What greater powers have the Scottish Government gained since 1999? But also, the, the deep question there is, well, what can we say if we compare the period after 2012 when the Scottish Government got more powers to the period before it, when it had fewer powers, what can that tell us about that question? Can that give us any greater insight into answering that question by comparing these periods of devolution? If we talk about achievements of governments, can we talk about these in objective ways? Where might we get objective criteria to talk about government's uh, achievements from, from academic sources? <laughs> Or are the achievements of government entirely subjective? Can we not actually come to any objective agreement on their object, on the uh, way we measure their objective and their achievements? Sorry. But then, so that's a, the deeper question there. But also, you have the more, more basic question: Well, what were the aims of policy? What did it seek to achieve? And how do the actual outcomes in society meet what 
the government aim to achieve. The classic case that uh, some of the essays have picked up on, on this for the Scottish Government is free higher education. It aimed to increase participation in education, in higher education, from people from deprived backgrounds. The actual outcome of the policy is not that. It has, the Scottish Government has fallen short on that achievement, and the evidence, the data shows that. The Students, the percentage of students from the poorest backgrounds in Scottish universities is now lower than it is in English universities. So the Scottish government is not achieving what it aims to in a policy, in the policy the way it's set out. On the devolution settlement point then, the question there is, well, should we just focus on the institutions of government, on that process of devolution, on the powers that government gain and the, the way they are used, or should we look at look broader? Should we consider the policy, the discourse, the way policy is talked about, and the language used by policymakers when we're when we're considering their achievements? So the final question, the one I got wrong, <laughs> from November 2016, not April 2017. From November 2016, the UK government will impose a cap on welfare benefits payments to households of £20,000 per annum. Is this fair? In my defence now, on getting this question wrong, they did bring the date forward. It was originally April 2017, but they brought it forward to November 2016, in my defence. So, anyway. So, there, so in this, the deeper issues are, well, I've said 20, November 2016, but how long has this current wave of welfare reform been happening? If we track it back to 2010, as you did in your workshop on the bedroom tax, where, where are the antecedents of this welfare reform? Is that a continuation of what, what was going on before? Or does 2010 mark quite a stark change in the welfare system? I've, this question focuses on the cap on welfare benefits. Uh, but what other changes are happening? How do these other changes compare to the welfare benefits cap? What else is the government doing to reform welfare? And the really deep questions of the why question is, well, why is the UK government committed to welfare reform? That, the last bit of this question, the is it fair bit of this question, really gets to that. Well, wh why are they so committed to this? What is their reasoning behind doing all these welfare reforms? If you go to the government website, gov.uk, it doesn't say, we're committed to welfare reform because we want, want everybody to live miserable lives like I, Daniel Blake. Funnily enough, <laughs> they have a very different message into why they are committed to carrying out these welfare reforms. Are all households the same? Many of you who answered this question focused on this, that this, this is a blanket policy that applies to all households. It fails to recognise the difference in households, particularly things like household size. And Groups like single parents are particularly negatively affected by the benefits cap. Going back to the why, well, what is the justification of the £20,000 figure? That links to that why question. And of course, the crux of this question, well, who, who is it fair to? Who do the UK government say this benefits cap is fair to? Is it fair to welfare recipients? Is it fair to taxpayers? Is it fair to hard-working uh, citizens? Is it f fair on those who are just, man just about managing? That's the latest one they're using. Who is this policy fair to? So these are the big concepts that you need to be thinking about. You need to be making sure that you understand that you've got a hold of. And you can have a you can think about them. So, hopefully, and actually I think you have, because I've, I've taken, I, I, say the um, tutors are marking their essays at the moment, I've been dipping into the Turnitin and having a look down the marks, and they're actually looking bloody good <laughs> compared to previous years, so I'm really quite impressed. And I've not, I've not done the math, so I can't say what the, uh, the, the average will be, and not all the tutors have finished marking yet, but so far it's looking good. So I think actually many of you have got your heads around these big concepts already. So it's about probably just going back to your essays and doing a little bit more reading. If you get your essay back, 
and your marks in the 40s and you go, oh crap, oh I really, really did very, very badly here, I've really missed the point here, you're at the pre-structural learning, what, how would you learn about the big concepts? Go and read the textbook. The reason why I bang on about it all the time, it is a really, really, really good textbook. The chapters are only six pages long. If you want to know about gender, read the chapter on feminism, read the chapter on women. It's that simple. It's so well structured. You'll be able to learn a hell of a lot very, very, very quickly by reading the specific chapters in the textbook. Journal articles on the resource list. The journal articles will really help to deepen your conceptual knowledge. And the resource list is thematically organised. Uh, so there's a stuff about the introductory stuff at the, the top. There's a devolution, a history section, a devolution section, and then some categories ar around things like uh, gender, ageing and disability after that. So it's very, very structured to help your learning, to help you deepen this conceptual understanding. And then if you want to dip into the blog as well, look back at what was written on there, use the categories. And I say, I'll do a blog post on how to use the categories. It's very simple. They're very self-explanatory. It's just a drop-down list that will search those blog posts for you. Right then. <laughs> just at the end. Actually, I'll, just, I'll remove the GIF actually for a while. Get, get a bit distracting. Another bit of my leadership course is to consider what we term emotional intelligence and to think about emotions. I think when we are helping you with assignments and guiding you on revision, we, because we are with the lecturers, we're educating you, we come across as very cool and calm and probably quite cold. And you're incredibly stressed and not very happy. And that's a bit of an awkward situation to be in. But also, we, we can't it can be very unprofessional to reveal actually how stressed we are by it all. By the fact we have deadlines for your marking to meet. Also, um, things like, well, the, the joy of when you do so well and when the, the gems in your coursework assignments and your exams come through that are so good and the joy we feel. We say, yes, they've done it. It's brilliant, so, so, so good. Feels so wonderful. And those moments do happen a lot. It's brilliant. <laughs> Especially on exams, it's like, bloody hell, the magic caught with that in the exam. Crikey. But also, yeah, there is a frustration there as well. It's like, oh, but, uh, God, they just didn't, <laughs> they completely missed the point. What happened here? Ah. And you like, oh, I feel really, really bad about that. And oh. So we, we don't talk about these emotions in assessment enough. So with the exam, you're probably feeling a bit like this. Are you absolutely fucking terrified? <laughs> yeah. Is that about it? Yeah. Yeah. If you're not absolutely terrified, you might be feeling a bit like this. A bit ashamed. You know you could have probably done better. You watch that video about the ideal student at the start of semester, you thought, oh, I'm going to be that person. And then you just went to the pub with your mates. And then week six, oh, it's reading week, I should do some reading. Oh, no, 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 I'm at home, I'll just relax and watch telly. Oh, fuck, my, my essay's due next week, I've done no reading, quick, panic, 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 panic. And you're handing something, you know it's not the best you can do, and you actually feel a bit ashamed about it. You know the, the, the mark's not going to be brilliant when you get it back. And oh, God, ah, yeah, I felt that as well. It's like when you hand in something, you just know you've not been able to, you could have done better. It's just a horrible feeling. And if you're not feeling terrified, utterly terrified or ashamed, then you might just be feeling just a little bit concerned, a little bit worried. It's mildly perturbed by everything that's going on. I want you, what I want to end on is just try and focus on those emotions. I think we shut down our emotions a lot. And it's, I was chatting um, to my leadership coach this morning about this. And kind of in this Instagram generation, you don't want to show that you're really stressed and upset because if you're a scar of runs and you're taking a selfie, it's going to look really shit on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> but listen to your emotions. Listen to that fear. Think, well, why am I, why am I scared? I know, I've, he's told me it's going to be in the, in the exam. I've done quite a lot of preparation. Accept that, that you're scared. Talk to your mates about the fact you're scared. If you're too scared, you might, mate, mate, your mates might say, shut up now, you're making me stressed. But 
<laughs> have a go, chat to them about how scared you're feeling. Because accepting that you have these emotions and listening to these emotions, expressing these emotions to other people will help you process them. You'll be able to say, yeah, I'm scared, and actually it's okay to be scared, because I've got an exam, I don't know what's going to be on it, and the exams are terrifying. And you've processed that, you've thought about it, and you can start moving on by it. And if you can do this, you work at this, and what I really would be nice to see, if you can turn that fear, this is where, I'm sorry, that was me doing my leadership bit, turn that fear into something more exciting. So think, think about when you're on a roller coaster and the little car, oh, you are absolutely terrified. You are absolutely fucking terrified. And then you go and stop, and you turn into a kitten. Yay! So try and process those emotions. Try and be, be honest to yourself and try and try, I know it's something really hard to do, but try and turn that fear into something more productive. Try and turn it into that stress, that fight or flight response, they'll actually get you doing something more productive, getting you excited. It's like, yeah, I get, I get another chance to show off how brilliant I am. Or, oh God, I've not done really, really brilliantly, but I can go read a bit more and have another shot at it and I can improve my mark. Try and turn it into that kind of excitement and engagement rather than just be scared and just be sitting there anxious and worried and feeling that knot inside of you. So, just to wrap up then, the immediate emotional response to that anxiety is just to fire an email off to your tutor or to me. I do, do get them, and my responses to them are particularly unhelpful, because <laughs> if you email me about the exam, I, I won't tell you anything more than is in this lecture. I can't tell you anything more than in, in this lecture. It's not fair on the other students. This is the help you're going to get from me in passing your exam. I've told you what to expect in the exam. I've told you how to revise, give you tips on where to focus your revision in it. So I can't tell you anything more than is in this lecture. I might just repeat something that was in this lecture to you, but I won't tell you anything more than in this lecture. I can't tell you how you're going to do either. That's up to you. It's up to how much commitment you put into your revision and how much commitment you put in through the semester into your engagement with the lecture. And also practical things, I won't tell you where your exam is. You've got to find that out for yourself. Those of you who've got a rulers, you'll be being emailed from the exams office with the specific details of where your exam is, if it's somewhere different. We do all know the time and the date of it, don't we? Just to, right, I know I kind of expressed this in my announcement, we are so angry about the time and date of this exam. We're going to John Gardner, the Deputy Principal for Teaching and Learning. We are so angry about the timing of this exam. They won't, the other exam on at the same time in the, in the Gamaki is also a two hour exam. There's no reason why they can't move even the start time to 10 o'clock. Which just, that, just, you'd think that would make sense, but no, no, no exams at Stirling start at nine and two. They have to start at nine and two. <laughs> I'm almost tempted to email the other module coordinator and say, do you fancy doing this, you know, sort of basically just cheat on this and just do it ourselves. So yeah, we're trying, we're trying to get it moved. So do look out for an announcement about the time being moved. It m probably won't happen, but we are taking this really seriously. It's bad for us as well as it is for you. Ah, yeah, I'm not going to tell you what's out for your tea either. So um, I will also, though, practically be putting uh, times up on succeed for when I'll be having office hours in the room to the exam. So if you are really anxious, if you want to come and see me and have my reassuring lilt, and I can look at you with puppy dog eyes, it's all going to be okay. I'm quite good at that talk, sort of talk. I think people will agree. I'm quite good at that sort of talk, aren't I? <laughs> um, so yeah, if you do want to come and see me about and have that sort of talk, then more than happy for you to pop by and have that sort of Sorry to embarrass you there. <laughs> or you're mortified. <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you very much. Next week is the Future of Social Policy lecture, which is the one I do without PowerPoint. Ooh.